channel. There, there was one little thing which had two quick snapshots of you, but you were just there, so I, I Okay, um, I the uh, History more. Channel did a nice piece on me about Bloody Sunday on the History Channel, but that's all right. Okay. Uh, what did you say, Jamalisa? Let's get started. I'm Jimelita Tillman, I'm the director of the Herewash Culture Center. We do Broadway musical theater, but nothing is greater than being this woman's daughter. So growing up, never knew when a civil rights story was going to break out. You always had a history lesson and you always set out to create history and make the world a better place. She was born in Montgomery, Alabama. She came up here with Dr. King at the young age of 16 to fight for open housing. She was an elected official for over 25 years where she was appointed by Mary Carol Washington. Washington. And she has a phenomenal granddaughter. That's her namesake. That's a 17 year old with a doctorate. You love her, we love her. Let's give it up for the Honorable Dorothy Wright. Oh, that's, 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 that's the intro. That's, that's your intro. That's your intro. Sure, you want to say something? Uh, just a I have some discussion questions okay. which I just sent to the two of you and if there's a way that there, there's a little, there's a little um, cell phone which could be nearby you you could see but I don't, what are the questions that we all need it yes I want to make sure you all get one of my books so we're going to talk about it for sure for sure, sure. Give all of one. okay what up to I want one okay, okay whatever let me what you want me to do I'm doing what you want me to do here how you want professor how you want me to do here here now I'm in some of his books I'm in some of his papers I'm just where did you get? Well, I guess we start with the question. What, what, what year did you do? What year? What age did you leave high school? Seventeen. When they brought my the blue one. Do you remember that? Huh? And why, why? Why did you leave high school? At that age? Oh, should I talk and then we do it? This uh, is what's happening. I'm okay. trying. I'm trying to have this. Can we have a Q and A with discussions? I, and I've, I've got about fifteen questions. With that. Okay. Well, let me just introduce myself. Let me say first of all. I want to talk to the young people. I love to talk to young people, so let me see what I want to say to y'all first. Sure, no, absolutely. Okay. Whatever you want. Um, my name is Dorothy Wright Tillman. I was born in Montgomery. I grew up in the civil rights movement. Okay. Uh, uh, when I was uh, nine years old, I met Dr. King. I never knew that I would be a part of Dr. King's staff. My mother carried me to, my grandmother carried me to the Hope Street Baptist Church. H O L T. So y'all take let's put this stuff, you know, look it up. It's all history. Uh H O L T Baptist Church. And uh, that's when we had the Montgomery Bus Boycott. When she gets the book over, I'm gonna show you something. But we had the Montgomery Bus Boycott. And um, I couldn't I, that's when I first met him, but he was so great. And I was nine, and I believe that I was baptized in the movement of my people at nine years old. But I had grew up in a church called the Bell Street Baptist Church, which, you read, which was born on January 10th, right after the bus boycott. And there was Reverend um, Pastor Fields, Reverend Fields was the minister. He was one of the ministers who selected Dr. King to lead our movement in Montgomery. And it's a lot of churches and stuff, and places got bombed at after the bus, bus boycott. So I just kind of grew up in that movement. I grew up, and, and being in church, um, our pastor told us to fight back. And you have to remember that I didn't, people don't tell me about the Klan, but I, was work, I saw them and we, we worked and, and saw around them and to deal with them. So, but I grew up in a very strong community. My family was strong, we didn't take too much. So when I um, met Dr. King, I said, God, my, and I asked my grandmother when I got older, why did you take me? And she told me that when I was a little girl, you know, you get on the bus, you go around, the bus was a DAY street bus we could take, and you get on the bus, and you put your money in the front, and you go to the back. You know where the, uh, the two doors in the back of the bus? And I could never understand why I could not, as a person, as a, knowing I was my grandmother, you know, you may dress me up and press my hair, why I couldn't sit in the front of the bus. All the little white kids were sitting there. 
Why couldn't I sit there? And my grandmother would always take me back. She just said, you can't do it. You put your money in, you have to go back there. And I would always try to be defined. So later on, I asked, so that's why, and I realized as I got grown, I know I was speaking at a seminary graduation in New York, seminary school. And that's when, when they asked me the questions, I realized why my grandmother carried me. And I didn't find out to the 90s. My grandmother carried me because she could not explain to me as a child why I could not sit on the front of the bus. So I knew Mrs. Rosa Park and, and all those, we had very strong women and, and, and very strong people. So that was kind of, you kind of, I grew up in that movement, knowing her, knowing all that. So Mrs. Parks, who did not, she did not give her gifts, she did not sit in the front of the bus. And it's very important y'all know that as we go into this movement. Um, she refused to give her seat up to a white man. Not that she didn't go in the front of the bus and protest. She refused because what happened when, um, when the bus got crowded, between that little piece where you opened up in the back, you get in and say, no man's land. And once they said no man's land, then you're supposed to, you know, if you're sitting there, you're supposed to get up. You don't have that seat. You don't sit while a white man is standing. So at that particular day, Mrs. Park refused to give her, her um, seat up. I understood why she, I felt she was doing that for me. We heard about it, I felt that, because I knew I wanted to do it. And uh, when Mr. E.D. Nixon, um, he went and he pulled together some people and told them Mrs. Parks had been arrested. My pastor, Ruben Fields, and some other pastors, and Abernathy and all of them came together and they decided they had to do something. And they had, um, they organized the MIA, the Montgomery Improvement Association. And the reason they did the MIA, MIA uh, Terry was because they didn't want the denominations to get in the way the organization worried about. So they decided they would come up with the MIA. And my past, my past from Fields was was one of the first. Um, he was one of the first. He was a secretary. In fact, they almost wanted him instead of Dr. King. But they, he wanted Dr. King, and I God wanted Dr. King. It was a he was pure then. And um, so that's kind of. I started in this movement. And when I remember when our church got bombed, uh, in fact, I'll be down in April as they unveiled the plaque. Um, when our church got bombed, I remember it was just, oh, you could just hit the bum, 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 bum. Just bombs going out all over the place. And I'm saying, because it kind of shaped my way of thinking. And it was a lot of, that was after we had, they, they decreed that um, we had a right to ride the bus where we want you. So then to, to retaliate, that's when they stopped bombing. And of course they bombed our church first because my pastor was one of them. So that was really kind of what grew up in me, but I, like I said, I never knew at nine that I would be on Dr. King's staff. So I became part of Dr. King's staff as a teenager when uh, Reverend Jane Bevel recruited us in Montgomery. Um, and I was among the first group of people of SELC staff to be sent into Selma to work on the right to vote. Uh, the children in Birmingham had uh, the church up in Bama. Reverend Bevel and Diane Nash said uh, that in order to do something about it, we had to, we could not make these folks do right, but we got enough folks registered, we could legislate and make them do right. So in SELC, didn't really want to take on nothing else that big. They all was fighting in the board, not having a discussion. So Bella and Diane left and came to Montgomery, and that's where they recruited all of us. And I was a student leader. And he said, hey, I said, what? I was like, he said, do you know your mama can't pee in the weed? I said, this man crazy. He said, hell no, that mama can't pee in the weed. So we said, because if you go, because if you go pee in the weed, you made the wrong weed, you get lynched, you get shot, right? And we said, yeah, it makes sense. Well, y'all need to come on and join this movement. We're going to make sure that your mom and everybody can vote and she can pee in any weed she wants to. We said, just laugh. This is crazy, man. You know, you know, we always talking about her. We just thought that was so funny. And we made jokes about, your mom can't pee in the weed. <laughs> but, so, but we ended up, uh, some, he ended up, I, 
myself, who really became part of the staff, myself and Leon Hall, God rest his soul, his son eventually became mayor of Atlanta. Leon was on one side of town, I was on the other. And a group of us who, we led all the marches, we did a lot of marches in Montgomery before we went to Selma. In fact, we wasn't going to go to Selma. Uh, I remember when we were in the MIA office, and it was Diane Nash is the reason you can find her. That's about, you know you've heard of Diane a lot. But um, it was her who said that we were at the MIA office trying to work out our strategy as we was marching one to jail and stuff. And Diane said, we need to present Wallace with a declaration of freedom. And that's when we made, okay, yeah. So we was trying to decide if we laid the freedom out how we was going to present it. And we had not decided on Selma. And what were we going to do that at? Now, could you elaborate? You said strategy. What was the discussion about how did you choose Selma and other places? That's what I'm going to tell you. Okay, now that, that's, okay. A, that's a big point. And I, okay, I'm going to take, that's what I'm telling you, take notes. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> we wasn't going to go to Selma. We just in that 12 million movie. I had been in jail. They told me, told my mama, my dad, they said, come back down, we're going to send out a crazy house. They was putting us, putting us in jail back and forth, but being a student, we were really, and so a lot of activity going on in Selma during that time. SNCC was down there trying to teach people how to uh, register the vote, like pass the Constitution test, shake the bubbles in the bottle and say, how many bubbles in here? You can't say how many peas in a pot, you wanna get registered. So everybody was trying to teach folks how to pass the test. So we never believed that. We believed that you break a law, an unjust law, and make it just. So while that was going on, and we were demonstrating so much in Montgomery, shut down the schools. That's when I, my, my, the problem, because I shut down the schools. We were shutting the schools down. I was smart, and my granddaughter, I was graduating at 16. All my stuff was done. We were just marching, getting ready for the graduation, and I'll come back to that in a minute, because he wants y'all to know about my Japoon. <laughs> he, that's a major piece in one of his books. But, um, so she said, we said, okay. So we were marching, we came back, and, we went back. We was, at that point, Sheriff Clark said no more than two colors could be on the street after dark. Because he was getting nervous. Montgomery, 50 miles away, we marched in Montgomery. And Smith, the Student Unbound Coordinating Committee, was down there moving around. And he was getting nervous about what might happen. So Jim Bell said, I know, I got it. We're going to go down to Selma, and we're going to put a whole bunch of colored folks on the corner. So that's probably how we ended up getting to Selma, rather than going to Baldwin County or Green County. Or, there's a lot of counties to go to, but we ended up in Dallas County because of SNCC being on there and, and a bunch of other folks who was there, and they were trying to register. And uh, they were, and so that's how we, and I was among the first group of people on the staff of SCLC to be sent to mobilize for the right to vote. Now, we're coming up Sunday on Bloody Sunday. The reason we have Bloody Sunday is we had no idea. And, and uh, we had no idea. Of, we was just going to the court. You can see C.T. Vivian. You can pull him up. C.T. is from Chicago, too. But he was going back and forth. Everybody's trying to register to vote. I went home that night, this particular night, because this time my grandmother told me to come home and get some rest. It wasn't a 50 mile. But would anybody have a And I, we knew that. Um, we just want to open this up. We knew, okay. We knew that um, they had arrested Jane Orange. She's, you probably, when you saw the movie that they did, that Oprah did, I'm so inaccurate, but you probably saw Jane Orange pick up Dr. King from the airport and all that. Uh, that's another one I asked that question. So they had arrested Jane Orange in and, and, and Perry County. And so. The group was going to go and pray up at the jail. We, we didn't think nothing was going to happen. So I said, look, y'all, I'm, I'm going to go home. So I went back to Montgomery and be home for that uh, particular night. I had no idea. Quite a few of us went home, went back to Montgomery. Because Lou looked and y'all going, we, we, got, we got this. And CT was kind of with them. So OK, we'll see y'all tomorrow. Had no idea that all the hell was going to break loose that night. So uh, Lula and all of them went down to pray at the jail. CT told me that he knew something was wrong 
when he got halfway out of Perry when he got halfway out of there, all the lights were off. They turned off all the lights. I mean, job. Couldn't see nothing. And they decided that night they were going to beat the hell out of these niggas. And they came to beat them. Folks started running. Julie Jackson, G I N M I E, write that down. He's a very important person y'all look up. Jimmy Jackson took a pee. He ran, everybody ran, he went to the cafe. Now, everybody went to the, some went to the cafe, some went to the So his father, his grandfather, who was very active with us in our movement, and usually it was the uh, funeral home people who would help us out. And uh, they was beating up, they beat up his grandfather, and our mother, the mother was trying to see about her father. And then they told him, shut up, nigga. They put the gun to him, and she, um, he went to, she took a bullet for his mother. So that's how he got shot. He stood in front of his mother. Very important, people don't tell that. He didn't die right away. Uh, he ended up dying a few days later. They still serve him. When you look him up, you're going to see they still serve him in the hospital. And uh, so when they shot him, and when he died, we, Bevel had been locked up somewhere that he ended up away, so they would split us up. So they let Bevel out, and we were, we were having a mass meeting. I remember that. It was so sad when I And Bevel said, very simple. So it's very important you know why we march. They just don't tell you the right stuff. He said, we're going to take this coffin, and we're going to take Jim Lee body, and we're going to take it and sit it on the Capitol Wallace, and Wallace Steps. So that was what we was going to do. And you'll find that out if they tell the truth. It's probably missing. And that's why we decided to march. And the family decided we wouldn't take the body. His, by the way, his, um, you're going to say a lot about that this weekend. And you can look it up. His stuff there, they got a lot of stuff they're going to be showing this week. But his, his body, he's buried at a slave grave, a slave grave. That's what he buried, that's what slaves was. So they buried the body. And the decision was made to, we're going to march. OK. Now, keep in mind, we had no idea. These folks got all out the norm, because I was part of direct action. And direct action means just what it says. So let's see, let's see I, was, I worked we had SCLC was structured in a way that everybody had things. So I worked on the level on direct action. And we decided we was going to put the people in, the, in different hundreds and let them march. We tried to get Sneak to march with us. I think Stephen Crime might have taken up. Uh, John Lewis had quit and left Sneak as being the chairman. And I think Stephen took over. And, you know, they was talking stuff like we had came in and took over. But they didn't want to march with us. They refused. But John Lewis from Sneak said, I'm going. See, John Lewis wasn't just leading that march. You know, everybody said he was. He was with. So Jose Williams was leading that march and that's from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But John Lewis came and he joined in front of the march and they both got beat up real bad. Folks focus on John, but Jose, both of them got, they got beat real, real bad. But John Lewis came in spite of what Nick said and nobody expected because we had another group in the comp. I was all like in the back. You know, you built strategically put folks in places so I can stop them from running and making everybody get hurt. Say, so it's going to be all right. You know, we're going to stay here like, you know. So strategically, not in the front. Because they never beat the front. They have never beat up the front. They always let you go over, and then they start in the middle. So in case they did it, there was a group of us who was responsible for not letting folks scatter. But they started in the front, and they beat the stew out of them. Uh, on the right side of us was the um, Alabama River. The left side was Alabama River. Behind us was the church, and in front of us was the state troop. And their shoes would be so shiny, them folks was clean. And we said, the whole world is watching you. The whole We never thought in our life that they would do that. Now, Miss Boynton, people got beat up. My mother said, when she looked and she saw that, she said, oh, Lord, she got on her knees and prayed. She said, oh, my baby, she didn't think I was going to make it today. But, Miss Boynton, you, she's a very important lady. You put her, Miss Boynton? Mm -hmm. Okay. We thought, they said, Miss Boynton is dead. And everybody panicked. 
She was laid out, and then they took her. You'll see whenever you look up Bloody Sunday, so Mrs. Uh, they took Mrs. Bunch because they thought she was dead because they put her in a an, in a hearse to take her to the doctor. So that's Bloody Sunday. That's what happened on Bloody Sunday. So after that, the whole world was watching, and of course, our team was so hurt, and uh, we decided then to we were gonna take this mall home. Uh, you know, I'm sure you heard about Ola Luzo. Y'all heard about Ola Luzo? She was a white woman from New York, I mean from Detroit, with five children. Her husband didn't want her to go down and join that movement, but she saw us get beat up and she came. But Ola Luzo was very, they had her in the movie, and I don't like what they did. They had us standing on the corner passing our sandwiches to the civil rights movement. They just messed up that movie. So they passed our sandwiches. This is Ola Luzo. But she had five children from Detroit. She saw us. We came all around the world to work with us. They assassinated Valerie Luzo after the march. I'm, I'm skipping so I can get to some other stuff. But do what you tell me about me. But I want to tell y'all about this. I'm going to tell you So Valerie Luzo, she was transporting the civil rights workers from um, the capital back and forth. In fact, I'm trying to find Leroy because I don't know my job. Leroy Moulton was in the car with him, with her. And they killed the plants, came by and just, she got that nigga in that car? And they just blew, they just blew her. They just, they, they just blew away. So by, by uh, Leroy being tall and skinny, we call him string man, he was able to get up under the uh, dashboard until the freedom truck came. Um, if you go down there, if you ever go to Selma, you'll see a little marker. She gave her life for something she believed in, and she left her children. So I always wondered, what happened to all the children? I was always worried about them. And I got a chance to meet her daughter. It was so wonderful. First I met her in Detroit, then we were in uh, Washington, we were doing a documentary. And we, um, we were doing, um, we, they were doing a documentary, and that's when I got a chance to meet her. Her children really got messed up. Some of them got to be alcoholic, but there's one daughter when you look her up, she's on the case. She's fighting, she's good. Her mother be proud of her. But the rest of them really got kind of messed up. Um, so that was Viola Yuso you need to look up. Julie Jackson, Viola Yuso, and all these other folks. So you can understand Bloody Sunday. Now, after Bloody Sunday and after all this stuff went on, we had to um, get our people ready to register. So I had a group of students. We had thought it's called SCOPE, some, some community organization for political education. That's the name of the organization, SCOPE. That was our organization, SCLC. And that part was headed up by Jose Williams. But, so I was in Choctaw County, but Alabama, Choctaw County, with a group of students from Ireland. It was all white students and one black, and their job was, they came down, a lot of the white college students came down to go into the counties we began to help teach black folks about registration and stuff. And at that point, I got called up here. I, I did a northern tour with Dr. K. I did a northern tour that summer. Uh, we did a northern tour to see what city we was going to work in. And Dr. King told Bella, and asked my grandmother, can I come to Chicago? Because he come to Chicago, he needed me up here. Because I worked with the youth. So I got the call to come up here. I was in Choctaw County having a good time with my group down there making them be conscious. I'm gonna go find some of those pictures. I know they just obviously they got them. But and they were really working hard. I, that was so sad when I left them. But they came down here for the night. That's when I got a call after the Northern Tour and they decided to come here and that I had to pack my bag. They were sending a car for me because I had to come to Chicago to work with Dr. King. So that's how I came to Chicago. I got to Chicago October, October 31st. 1965 uh, to work on the house and everything. And my first um, thing I worked on in Cabrini Green with uh, Arjun Woodry and uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bryant, we worked against Jenna School, Chucho. So my first assignment was, was the North. I worked on the North side at first, then I got the rest of the stuff. But he wanted me to go in terms of, now Mr. Smiley, he wanted, I gotta tell y'all about that because he wants you to know about that. Mr. Smiley, you can go learn some more stuff tonight, then. Uh-huh. He didn't just interview me to death. He had a lot, I'm gonna need to sit a good person. But Mr. Smiley, 
was principal of Booker T. Washington High School, my principal. And because I was one of the students, leaders, and Wallace, who run everything, said, you better take care of them. So, Ms. so Wallace talked to Mrs. Smiley, our principal, and talked to the caller. I was at Booker T. Washington, I was the other guy. Talked to Carla, who were reading. You stop them, they lean that stuff. So Mrs. Smiley said, now, mind you, it's summer. The seniors doing nothing but practicing for graduation. All of our, all our stuff is in, our pictures been taken, we doing our stuff, we getting ready for graduation. So, Dorothy Wright is wanted in the office immediately. I said, well, shit. I knew he was going to give it, so I, I was running. I wasn't going nowhere until I got through doing the organization I had to do to get them kids in front of the Capitol, because I was responsible for turning the school off. So I was hiding. I was hiding, getting in the toilet, standing all up on the toilet seat, because they were looking for me. You know? <laughs> so when we got everybody in place, I wanted to see my stuff. Mr. Smiley. Mr. Smiley said, I understand how that demonstration. Where do you understand that from? Oh, I know. And you head this stuff up, and you going to stop it? Because he was scared. That man was scared too. I was smiling. He said, because Wallace told him he didn't get to get a handle on this school. You know, and you got to stop it. And you can't do this now. I said, what am I doing? He said, I. He said, yes, sir, because you're going to be disrespectful. And stop. You're going to disrespect your elders. So he said, I want you to call it off. Then I said, I can't call it off. He said, you called it on, didn't you? I said, I'm part of the group. I said, man, you are a martial He said, what did you say? <laughs> oh, it was a big mouth. <laughs> so then he said, he pulled his, he, he, my, he, my diploma was in his drawer. He pulled it out. I would hear the cigar. And he said, now, he held that thing up. He said, he said, do you want this? I said, I earned it. He said, if you don't call off the demonstration, you won't get it. So he took his, I said, I'm not calling off nothing. I got angry, but I still was respectful of my anger. And he took his, that cigar, Mr. Smiley, and he burnt my diploma. And to the act that he said there and watch the ash in his eye could be dismissed. I said, thank you, and one day you're going to respect me. And I promise you. So as a woman, I had grown up, because I came home, uh, George Wallace went all along. And then that book, you're going to find out where um, that's when I'm. You're going to see Rosa Parks up on me in that book. But then Wallace asked me, told, they told, Wallace told Rosa Parks to give me over to the Capitol. I got a whole thing where he gave me, you don't know that. He said, when I came home that year, Mr. Smiley said, you know, I'm so sorry. He told me he was scared. He didn't know what was going on. And he said she was right. I was like, hey, I went on. I finished school. I did a bunch of stuff. And he, so, when the integration came, he was the first one he grew to day five. He was, boom, he's out there. So that's that's kind of the story. Um, then I was, uh, Jimmy, just give me one, give me one of those. So then I was, uh, but I was very involved in uh, fighting for education here. I would think that I played a major role in Harold Washington becoming mayor, but especially in Barack becoming president. And just being active, uh, I think that, uh, and I think we have to. I get a little disgusted. I'm, I know y'all got questions, and I'm gonna hear y'all. But I, and maybe I'll answer it in y'all question. I get disgusted with all this demonstration and how these folks are being led astray, because the demonstration is not real. It's bullshit. I'm a. I'm a nonviolent scientist. Okay, from Southern Prestige Conference, we had to be nonviolent, and nonviolent work. Trust me, it worked. We changed the world with nonviolence, and you have to understand. You got steps of nonviolence, and you got principles of nonviolence. And if you work with both of those, those things work. The first step of nonviolence is get the information before you do anything. That's the first step. I taught that stuff. I taught people good, and you can be good too. And nobody will lead you astray. They won't make you be white guilt or black guilt or nothing else or no mess. You're going to do what's right. So the first step of nonviolence, get the information. 
Then you got a principle. You can find out about the principle. We, the principle is not about, and these, I'm just going to tell you about three other things. I'm going to tell you about two steps and one principle. The third principle of nonviolence is that, that you fight the injustice, not the person. That's right. You understand? Do y'all understand that? You, you fight the injustice. Because if you, if you just fight the person and not the injustice, you can get rid of the person and the injustice is still there. And then once you fight the, the person with the, the personal stuff, rather than injustice, you can't have room for the last step of nonviolence, which is reconciliation. I can't have reconciliation with you if I just fight you. But if I can deal with your injustice, at the end we can do restitution. That was our principle, Dr. King's principle, our principle for the Christian Leadership Conference, and I live and I die by that principle. That's why anything that I do, anything I do, and other folks too, I teach them this because what I've been taught, and I just know that nonviolent work. You don't get folks, let's go burn out, let's go more. What you want to do, what you gonna get? What's the, what's the information, what's the step? And our young folks is being so led astray, like I see y'all and I see these folks out here, and then I think about the young students I had at I from I who came, and how hard we worked and how we laid out stuff to make a change, not destruction, to understand stuff. And we are in so much trouble right now, because nobody knows the timeless principles. They think there's something wrong with it. Trust me, it worked. And it works and I had changed America and changed the world. It did. And it changed them. And you know, we believe in the kind of principle and other stuff. And uh, you tell folks as a nonviolent scientist, you become a scientist now. You have to when somebody give you truth, you got a scientist have to adjust their truth according to adjust their strategy according to truth, right? That's all you gotta do. Now any questions y'all got for me, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm listening to y'all. What question? Come on. You see, y'all got a bunch of questions and discussion. Did I go on too much, Terry? No, no, no. This is great. I, I have a number, but let's let, let the students first if you have anything. I got it. Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, Alderman. What was the I can't hear you. What was the second step towards nonviolence? Well, the first the first step, you can find it online. The first step is of the the step, the first step is gather the information. Right. You got 10, nine steps, it's a bunch of, I don't have to go, if I go through all of them, I gotta explain them to you. Right. I'm just giving you the most important one, like the first step in the, in the reconciliation okay. of the principle. The rest of them, you look them up. They're trying, okay? But uh, it's very important, that's why folks can't get along and they can't come up with nothing. They just always attacking the person. And, and for what? I don't like what you did wrong. And you know, they can't even have discussions. Because they don't know who's right, they just, you know, and then we can't have reconciliation to make things better. Reconciliation is a very important thing. Not only is Christian things, but it's things to do. You know, you're supposed to be, uh, Miss King reconciled with Reagan, and, and Reagan gave us the holiday. We wouldn't have the holiday, and she just was mad. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff that was done. You know, when you look at what Bush gave us, Dr. King Memorial, people had to reconcile whatever the, whatever the other stuff they had. They had to go on top. You have to be the talk to get things done. But you can't reconcile when you just, I'm not going to talk to you if you don't bash me. And not, I won't hit you back. And you might be right. But then if you're right, then let's talk about the injustice I've done to you. We used to call it raising the level of consciousness. That's what we call it. Let's go raise some level of consciousness. He said, we said, hey, we all know, we're going to do some conscious raising. So that's, yes, sir. Um, what was the most important advice you were given as a kid that got you through everything on the issue of growing up? Because I'm hungry and I grew up in the South. See, South is just different from Northern folks. And I grew up in the South. Uh, and by my, um, my mother had to raise them and cook for them and us too. So, you know, I had my little white sisters and brothers who my mama had to raise. You know, so that we had another interdependent relationship, okay? So we ended up, ended up we had interdependent. That's why when, when the um, integration, desegregation came, the South is doing better than the North is because of the interrelationship that the North and the South had. In fact, when I was in the Civil Rights Movement, Linda was going on, that's my sister. I said, what are you telling about that, Linda? She's doing a lot of great things. She said, her mama used to raise me. <laughs> her mama took care of me. And she did because their mother wasn't there. So you got to end the relationship. I was told to treat folks right. You know, you don't have to, if you're right, you don't have to be scared of anything. 
but I really was told to put God first. And uh, you can't be. And the movement taught us so much. We had to, we read a lot. We had to study. In fact, when we got here, we had to, we studied with the U of C in that glass building y'all got up there on 5th and 8th, 6th and 1st. The building got a lot of glass in the 6th and 1st. Yeah, where they uh, taught us urban stuff. We went and we got here, we had to meet with them, and then we learned about the urban, and we had to learn how, how Chicago worked and stuff, and the urban stuff. That was part of gathering information when we got here, so, you know, we had to, we had to read a lot. Um, uh, we had to, uh, I remember, when I heard, I couldn't figure this one out, what the hell they want us to read conspicuous consumption for? Uh, I said, what that got to do with the civil rights movement of freedom? I don't want to read that book. We would have to always study and then have a discussion like we do here, what we thought about it. But since I got older, I kind of understood it then. But since I got to be an older uh, person and dealing with all this stuff going on, I think what they was doing was showing them how to develop character. That conspicuous consumption. And uh, we was always told, we're a conspicuous consumer now. You know? But it was, they, we had to read stuff to develop character. Uh, like I remember reading uh, Dog Ghetto by Kenneth Clark when I was young. Know, we had to do a lot of reading and studying. And we studied a lot with UFC when we came here. When they saw all these some other folks and planners up in that field, all I remember was all that glass. We had to come up here and study with them. So wherever we went. But uh, I was told, don't be afraid. If you can't fight, it's scared. Because if you do something, you're going to get hurt. You wear your cemetery suit. If you go to die, you're going to die. You're going to say you're like, you're going to die. But you just have to be right and believe. You know, if you don't believe it, you don't do it. Mm -hmm. But God first, that's me. That's what we, and our movement was led by people who believed in God. They don't talk about this. They say, MLK, I like calling him MLK. I had milk. Dr. King was not like that. Dr. Uh, King was scared. He was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But the children don't know the role, even since we came from being enslaved, the role that the church and all of that stuff in our faith, how our faith has sustained us. So now I don't have no faith. They just have faith in BS, hurting folks up. Temple, short temple. You gotta take time, we have to talk. When, when, you, when you first came to Chicago, did you did, could you stay in black churches or where? Or where who well, was? when we came to Chicago, a lot of uh, the black churches were scared to touch us, a lot of them, because uh, Daly had his Negroes, all his plantation people, all the politicians and ministers had a press conference, and they said um, they didn't want us here, black folks. We never experienced that before. Because at least if they didn't want us, they'd be quiet. So they, um, they told us to go home. So a lot of scared churches were scared, but there was a handful of churches that were not frightened. And we always kept our, our office inside of church. So you had Liberty Baptist Church. I remember that name, all my getting in trouble. You had Liberty, and then Clay Evans Church over there at Fellowship, Daily wouldn't give you a bit. We had a friendship on 71st Street from Freeman, uh, from the hall on the west side. We only had a handful of black ministers who was not frightened. Uh, we ended up with our office on Warren Avenue in Albany. You go to church, you still I take folks on the tour side. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a congregational church now, but Bill Briggs, great, he's great, he's a white minister. Bill Briggs brought us over there. I think he was in New York. It was a congregational church. I don't know if you only you heard of Bill Briggs. He's a great man. Um, so we ended up with our office over there, the Con Warren Avenue Congregational Church. And that's because Andy and C.T. Ambassador Young and C.T. Vivian was um, congregational. So that's where our office was. Because we were the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we always tried to operate outside of the church, inside the church. The church is there. It's a Baptist church or something now, but the blue room is there. Sometimes I think I took my baby over there to see the blue room. I, uh, I saw they was doing a documentary on Dr. King, and somebody told me to find him one day. So I took him to all the stuff they've done. But no, they were, they were really frightened. See, fear paralyzes you. It makes you make wrong decisions. And uh, they were really scared. Dr. King said, um, Chicago, <laughs> I like Chicago, who did? I took out always. Mock, right? So we had to go too. I, I love Cleveland. I said, I don't like this place. I want to go. So we were at a meeting at 47 and uh, South Park then at the CCCO office up there. And I said, uh, I don't want to stay. I want to go. 
These folks don't want to say, why are we staying? And Dr. King told us that Chicago got some strange kind of Negroes. Yeah, first of all, Dr. King, he, he had a good sense of humor. He was such a loving human man. It is humor, though. It was always something he was saying to you. But he had a way of making you laugh and soften things up a little bit. Even if we talk about that, we can do it away. So he said, yeah, doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you know she's right. So what you, he asked, I said, well, I'm not staying. He said, oh, no, she's right. So we, had a, we would always have a discussion before we finally get through. So I gave my opinion. And we just talked, and he let everybody talk. He said, well, what, what, what? Chicago is a strange kind of place. You got some strange kind of Negroes. He said, their plantation is worse than their plantation in Mississippi, and all they get is a garbage can top. <laughs> so that was kind of like his explanation about the plantation mentality. Whereas in the South, it was on the plantation, but it was the other thing they were getting. And he was, in so many words, letting us know the mentality we had to deal with as we dealt with these people. Yes, sir. Um, who was, who were uh, Davies' men? I know Alderman Dawson, or Congressman Dawson, was very Of course, Dawson was the other men. All them, any politician that was in office, we came in with daily people. Now, Harold Washington was a representative. His father, Royal Washington, was with the machine. Harold didn't go to the press conference. That's how he got to be named Maverick. Harold went and he had the snook and came out to the march and did all that. He always got a lot of trouble with Royal coming out there with us. You know, Harold was always, you know, because daddy was top there and there, but all the politicians in Chicago. I mean, you couldn't get an office. It's a plant, that's the end of the plantation, the structure. And you didn't have that many people that was elected. It was a structure, it was that plantation, and I think, plantation politics, I think Tim, uh, Tim Blackhorn had phrased plantation politics, I think. And um, it was a plantation. And, and, and you know, people deal with that, I, I see that now, but it's another kind of way, you know. That's why I don't, that woke and all that mess, they mess with folks' mind. I don't care what you do. I don't want to hear if it's not dealt with, if it's not, if it's not in truth, and you can have a discussion and lay it out, then you're gonna get mad because you can't have a discussion, then there's something wrong with it. Because if you're right, you, we should be able to talk about it, and I should be able to see it. But if, if you can't say nothing, do you crazy? Then there's something is wrong with something. You gotta have a discussion. That's something you want to talk, let's talk. Let's talk about it. Because you might be right. As I tell you, as a non bill of fact, you got to adjust yourself, not the person who gives you their right. Yes, sir. So you, like, you talk about your relationship as like an activist with politicians. Huh? You talk about, like, at, like when you're an activist, you talk about your experience with politicians. How did that impact your experience as someone, as an alderman in Well, I thought I was one of the best alderman to the head. Because I don't think I was, I was one of the Harold Watson, Harold Watson appointed me. Uh, first, I was, I had, I didn't want to be involved in, I wanted to work from the other side. And I had children. And I got involved in the school system. And uh, I was fighting for the school. But Harold ran for Congress. That's when I first met Jess, Jackie. But Harold ran for Congress. Somebody told him about me. He came with me and said, I heard that you used to be an organizer, Dr. King. I said, yeah. Thank you, was good. I thought one of the best. I need you to help me. I said, nah, uh, I'm raising my babies. He said, I need you. I need somebody to go in that third ward and take it from me. I said, uh, Stroger was running, Benny Stewart, was a bunch of them all of but the Red Metcalf, all a bunch of folks. Because Metcalf Senior had had a heart attack and died, it. and Jane Byrne had um, had a point in Stewart. But I was really uh, kind of upset anyway because we helped put Jane Byrne in, and then she turned on us. You know, that's that we was determined to pay, can make her pay a price. But because we put her in, we thought she'd be good. Uh, so I, uh, that's when I met Jack Grimshaw, uh, Professor uh, Grimshaw, who's passed, one of his friends. His, I met his wife. She was courting a bitter award. I said, okay. Harold said, all I want you to do is break even. I said, break even? I don't play that. You said I was good. Now you want me to break even? He said, I take the third award even. I can take it. I said, well, I'll take it. You can't, she was a baby. I had her put her in the little baby drawer. In the drawer? I had her put her in the drawer. She had the breastfeeding and put her in the drawer and stuff. So I, um, I told Jackie, if she give me my own office, let me pull my staff together, and let me lay my strategy out. 
and Jackie Grucho Matilda. On election night, when Harold ran for Congress, he was on 60, he was on Wentworth, and he's a 60 person Wentworth Club's office was a sanctuary office. And uh, Harold sit over there, Jack Harold out, and the third ward came in three to one. He said, damn, Dorothy. I said, yeah. He said, let's go on and declare victory. So that was really my real strong suit in doing that. I had worked in Area C with some folks to help Jane Murray get me, but I went into it like that. And uh, so he won. And that kind of, you know, that's went on. And then we, um, we put together CBA, Chicago Black United Community. All the organizations came together with Palmer. We all did a lot of stuff. We fought Jane Byrne, we fought the housing. Jane Byrne got rid of all the black folks off of the board, so we had to organize to get her. But she got rid of Michael Stein all of them. She got CHA, but she did a lot of crazy stuff, which made us have to organize. And out of that, uh, we start saying, we shall see in 83. And Harold won't get us, so we, so that was kind of, but here again, I was really enjoying being a mother. You don't understand. I had been on the spotlight since I was nine years old. I had babies. I love my children. I was, it was really nice. And I got kind of flown back in. And in fact, I didn't want to be the third ward all of them. We was putting people in every ward to go down there with Harold. We put Harold in. And I was trying to find somebody to take on Tyrone Kennedy. And they were scared. And they came here. We said, too bad. You got to do it. You got to tell the folks to do it. You got to take it. I said, but I don't want it. So that's how I ended up. And when he kind of got indicted, then everybody wanted me to go back. But that's how I took on Chad Ron Kenner. Corrupt. The most corrupt. He was so corrupt. He was so corrupt, though. And he went to jail. So Harold and the people were to tell Harold, don't appoint it, don't appoint it. They organized. And Harold said that was one of the best decisions he made was to appoint me. And while I was all of them, I was very good for my community in terms of economic education. And I used the, uh, the power of the office for the people, not for myself. And that's why they came after me, because that's what I was doing. OK, any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so like, what work do you think still needs to be done um, to advance civil rights in this country? Good question. Because your, your work is almost harder than what we had. I mean, we was very clear on our enemy and what we were doing. and Because y'all got so much. You know, we did stuff on the mimograph machine. You know, got TikTok. <laughs> but no, it's, um, and you got so many forces coming at you. And I think the force, that nonviolent movement is not getting through to people to be able, you know, it's all violence. It's all hate. You know, hate, you can't think in hate. And um, we, gotta, we gotta deal with the whole question of function illiterate students. The school system in this city, and in this fresh northern cities, these students are function illiterate. Like I have a granddaughter who just got a doctorate at 17, she got a double master in environmental science at 14, and so on and so on and so on, that's her daughter. But she homeschooled her, we couldn't put her in, we took out a computer. In the system. The system would have destroyed her. Dorothy just, she, ASU at, at her State University, she got a, a, a master's, double master in environmental science, community, one of the best environment. Everybody wanted, they wanted to hear UC, John Hopper, everybody wanted Dorothy. They still be, she going to speak, but she's, but uh, education and economics are the two most important things. And critical thinking, you know, it's like a, when I would tell you about, um, what we had to do to read the book. We had to be critical in our thinking. And I, there wasn't nothing to be on the wrong side. Y'all don't know how that felt. You just sit down on that dog. And we have a discussion. So I think you got it. And then you don't have it. I, a lot of times I don't have it, but I have it a lot of times. So when you have it, you shut up and learn, you know. But folks don't want to do that anymore. But I think that um, Chicago and these northern cities, most of America have failed the black community in terms of miseducating our children. And they go to school every day. And they can't even function. They can't read. That's why it's easy to manipulate them and say, hey, go burn them. Go do this. You got critical thinking is important. You know, you got to have critical thinking. You can't, you can't be critical in your thoughts. You can't do nothing. You don't, you don't know all the stuff. You know, my grandmother used to say, 
And I didn't realize what she meant. You gotta be able to think you have a paper bag. So I said, Mother always said that. My children don't think about a brown paper, paper bag. But as I got older, I understood critical thinking. But I think education and economics is very, very important. Because um, if not, people become useful idiots. We got a bunch of useful idiots running around here talking. And they think they, know, and, and they don't mean no harm. They don't even know that they're doing wrong. They really think they got it. They got it. And they're being used. Used to it because they don't want to say, well, let's, let me ask them. You should be able to ask me a question. Why I can't ask you a question? What? You know, and my, I'm really concerned about the education system, uh, very much so. Um, because if, if, a, if a person cannot read and write and, and can't be educated, can't get a job, what you gonna expect? I mean, what do you expect of somebody who can? So I think those are two important things. And I, and I think people gotta stop hating. That's very, that hate stuff is so deep. It's too deep. And see, one thing about nonviolence, there's no room for hate. I tell you, Clark, when I went home, uh, Wallace gave me, I got the whole thing, I might put it in my book. He said, girl, you done made out of down the proud. We see you up in Chicago, because I was out there doing, but I could go talk to Wallace in spite of what he had done, because reconciliation. And in Alabama, them folks get along just fine. And I got people down there, I'll be down there in April unveiling some stuff. But you gotta, you gotta leave room for reconciliation. Do you, somebody gonna get hurt or somebody gonna, you gotta leave that room. And everybody has something to say and what they say is important. You're not the only one to have something. And you might get something, you know. Did I answer you all right? Okay, yes sir. What's it like seeing the change uh, in the environment you grew up in and the environment you're in right now. Yeah, there's something in it. Well, I go home when he grows up. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. No, it, it's really, it, 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 it feels good. I took my uh, children to where I was born and walked around. And, and that's why I hate the statues coming down, right? They got folks, tear down the statue, tear down the statue. That's these little white folks telling my kids about to tear down these damn statues. You tear down the statue, you can't get the history. Teddy Roosevelt. Tearing the statue down. If one for Teddy Roosevelt, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't even have, um, we wouldn't have Tuskegee. He worked with you, with, you know, instead of taking that particular statue and educating people about our history. If not, we get buried. So I took my children, I took my other granddaughter, she's a senior in college. I took her one girl, she said, Tall Grant, everything down here is a statue. <laughs> so I was, took her and I was just educating. We take it and we educate people. You know, you don't, um, just tear down stuff. What right did anybody have to tell our children to tear down stuff? Cause they, I'm mad at them, tear it down. No, this fucker, he had a slave. He did this, go look up, understand that. What happened to him? You don't, you don't tear down, you gotta learn. History is important. When I told somebody that, that, uh, that Teddy Roosevelt was responsible for helping Bull Bill Tuskegee, he said, Head down. When I told her, I said, What? Now, that child of Tuskegee asked me, You can tell down Tuskegee, too. And you think about what Rosemont did, all the stuff Rosemont. It was people came together. There was differences. But the history has to be told. So if they won't think that there's no hope or there's no nothing, because you'll think, Is there nothing? You know? I have somebody, nobody better ever tell my grandchildren, said, Stimmy. Racism and all white folks are racist and this and that, but I tell them that because it's not true. I'm not just saying that because of y'all, but because I don't believe that. You know, I teach them something different. And then and then you got the white folks running around with white guilt, guilt letting them do every darn thing and say, I'm not doing that. It's scary, it's fear, and it's hate. If it's wrong, you talk about what the wrong stuff is. Raise some consciousness. What I said, raise up consciousness. And I and I really talk to my grandchildren, my children, uh, do not get involved. Like they go off to school, don't get about that hate mess. Find out what the information is when it doesn't make sense. Now, if something wrong, correct it, but don't let nobody lead you blindly toward hate. Tear my buddy. I ain't seen him in a long time. That's my little white friend. I'm gonna tell folks I can't even see my little white friend. I'm laughing, I'm just joking. I got a lot of little white friends. How can folks say that? Or how can they tell somebody, don't be the black guy, don't do this or that? It's like, I think the hate is what? The hate is the hate and not being able to talk. 
and there are other forces. And, and y'all so, boy, the black and kids, y'all and all y'all got an opportunity to have such a world that's so, we, world we talk about because we have the stuff to do with, but there's a fall like in the way. You know, y'all got a world that I didn't have, but I probably have, you know, Northern folks might not have a relationship with white folks as much as we had down south. Because they stayed on this side and they stayed on that side. And in the south, we were interdependent on each other. You know, just that simple. Whether you was on the plantation, whether you was in the slave, but there was an interdependent relationship. So the southern folks believe in law and order. Folks that make you think they're just racist. That's not true. Most racist folks is up here. So when the law, the laws was passed, they Start doing the law. So you go out there, you see people working. Uh, one of the one of the girls from um, DOE went to down south. She said, Talk all of them. I said, What? I went down to them folks just working, all them black folks working. I said, Yeah, they work. Everybody working. They're working, they're doing stuff, they're building side by side. It's up here. It's that division. So we can get past the division, you know, and have a talk. Oh, I, I might not even agree with you, but I have a responsibility. This is you got what's wrong to listen to me. I should want to fight you because you, you got an opinion. It might not be worth nothing. It just be, be, might be grounded in some mess. But you can't find the mess if you don't talk. Anybody else? Hey, what pages, Miss? Take your picture. So, Maggie, uh, okay. find the public. Uh, follow, up, uh, follow up question. You've talked about the bigger issues. How about the emotions? How about changing people's views by, you mentioned, Having a good joke that you, people will laugh. Yeah. You've used hats. You've used you're, with your husband music. You had a party at the Palmer House Ooh. with all kinds of people oh, dancing, yeah. dancing together. The praying, the, yeah. the the choosing, the choosing words and and, and slogans. Uh, Come alive, October five. Uh -huh. Things like that. These engaged people yeah. very successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has, have people have, have have you worked with people who've ex talked about this strategically of using the arts, emotions? You do it all. We did. That's what I was saying. And you did it, but did you talk about it? And did you have a you know why? Of course you we did. did. Um, tell, tell us a little bit, okay. please. <laughs> I'd love Come alive, October five. Um, <laughs> Mr. Gardner did that. After we was already working on. Um, yeah, we was together. Blue Palmer, myself, all of the black community. Well, really, we had um, Slim Coleman and some of the poor white folks from the north side was with us, up north, and uh, some of the Latino community. So I should say that. We always talking about, um, um, this is funny. We wanted to do deputy registration. LaBelle was the chairman of the Board of Education, the uh, Board of Election then. Jane Byrne was the, board, was the uh, mayor. And we was trying to get the registered people in public places. We were responsible for the deputy register program. All those folks I just told you about. Jeremy Gladder, Helen Schiller, all of us. Helen was white, all of them. We, Helen went in up there. We all was part of that movement. And um, we decided we was going to register folks. We had to register as people, but we was going to get Jane Byrne out of there. So in the black community, we had that organization with the big community. But our community, we came from the Chicago Black United Community. Back to MIA, I guess. But we all had to come together and work together and work on putting people in place and registering our people. And we should teach them and talk about how we were going to do it. Um, as we were doing that, we were registering people. And Mr. Gardner saw what we were doing. We were going to jail, doing all kinds of fights. And Mr. Gardner uh, had Nate Clay, he just passed, God rest his soul. Came over to us, and we all met on the west side. And Mr. Gardner said, I'm going to do because at that time, you could only vote right on election day. Besides, when we had got down at the welfare office and stuff. So come alive October 5 was the day, October 5th when that time was the day you go in, in the precinct and register. So we came up with it. Everything we did was a strategy. And that was haphazard. Don't ever let anybody tell you anything is haphazard. If you got an idea, let's talk about it and see how we can judge it work or does it not work. Uh, Harold Washington, I remember uh, Barack Obama, you probably see him in there. The um, Emil Jones. See, the black community didn't like Barack. Oh, they can't stand him in Chicago. Because he was messing with us. Came here trying to dump everything we had. So, Black Hall, Black Hall, I think, was running. 
for Senator. And um, all of the black leadership, I would say all of the community, they decided to uh, support Blair. I don't do things for money. So, you know, I wasn't in nobody's camp. So, uh, Emil Jones, who was a senator, who, who really was Barack Godfather, who gave him all the stuff when he was down in Springfield and moved on. He called me up and said, Doc, you're going to be in my book too. I said, what? I'm writing another book, y'all. This is just, this ain't going to do your hair. But everybody, why you wear your hat? So I answered it right there. That was my, so um, he said, I need you to help Barack. I said, okay, I'm not helping him. So he said, uh, nobody in the black community is helping him. I said, that's because what he did to all of us when he came. He immediately came and went against us. So he said, I know you're not with uh, Blair Hall, are you? I said, no. How you know that? He said, just, he, you ain't going to take no money from that man. You're not going to be about to put no money. So I do like to talk to you. So he asked me to, um, would I take Barack Obama and have the black people to embrace him? You might see him in that book. I got him standing up. 200,000 people out there now. Out there now. And I took him all around to all of the uh, senior building here and said, this is our son, this is what we got to do, and the rest is history. He wasn't going nowhere. Blair Hall had paid everybody off. He was, everybody was working with Blair, but uh, Emil Jones had faith in him. Those were just kind of, uh, I wasn't thinking about that, but I listened to Emil, and I heard what he was saying, and, and at that point, you know, you have to wait, based off what, what he done, do I hold that, or do I help get him in the Senate? You know, because, to me, getting them in the Senate outweighed that other little mess with this internal thing we had going on in the black community about him. Did I answer? Who asked me that question? You? You. Well, we're on the arts, music. Oh, I believe in the music. We're in the arts. We get to hear Washington Culture Center at the festival. Well, we, music well, is very important. Music is, we, that's all we sing in the civil rights movement. Our music is, uh, is spiritual. Music is very important. Now. You have to listen and make up music and do music. If you don't have the music, and you know, he was talking about the joke. We are, like I tell you, Dr. King always joked. We joked. You have to have music. You gotta relax your mind. You gotta art, you know. Like Dorothy, she's a great artist. Mm -hmm. My one that's got the uh, master, has uh, got the, the doctorate, uh, the PhD, Dr. Dorothy Tillman. She's an artist, she draws. She, died. she got beautiful things, but she also acts in the theater. And all of my children play music, and I try to push children toward music, toward art. You know, and I know, uh, Terry, that God is an artist, because he has to be the creator of all this stuff. You know, and when you get people around art and music, it look like all the other stuff go away. Folks just enjoy themselves. It's something about art, something about uh -huh. Any other questions with us you got? When, when you had your party at Palmer House, big ballroom. Oh, he just won all that stuff. I don't want to do it. Mayor Harold Washington was dancing. He, he in there. I got him in there. He was dancing a lot. I think I got him. He was He got down. He, his, he was a boxer. And he, yeah. he, he wouldn't look at his partner dancing. I think he in there. <laughs> dancing. Fists were there. Yeah. He looked serious. He looked as if he was going to let him have it. And then when the music was over, the end of the, the end of the dance, big smile and a hug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he actually did. I, I always incorporate music. My children's father's an artist. He's a musician, he's a music teacher. Uh, his name is Jimmy Tillman. He's a very well known person all over the world. Jimmy with a Y. Uh, so I love music, I love art. And music brings people together. Jim Leach is a great artist and writer too. She that I know. I write stage plays with Broadway music. She just got yes. through with a we were part of the who was part of the Chicago uh, Theater, Chicago Theater Week. We just got through with Lean on Me. It was packed every night. Her musical. Uh -huh. Based on the interpretations of the school system. Makes you know she yeah. writes plays. And how we still see that today. But all my children play music, they do that. Their father said that uh, when they were young, that play music, play chess, and Music, chess, what a normal thing. Uh, Monopoly. No. Music, music chess, chess, I know. You had to play music and you had to play chess. Uh, those were two things you had to play. He had three things that do. Oh, Scrabble. Yeah. Uh-huh. Those are things they grew up with doing, you know. And if you drive up King Drive to 47th Street, there are four corners, and, it, and you've transformed the image of, of, the, of the most important corner mm -hmm. in Bronzeville by having Music musicians on four different coasts. 
high up in the air. And Ed Dwight, Ed Dwight, uh, who did also did Harold. Harold Stacks on that one. They did the, Ed was the first black astronaut trainee. He also a great artist. They did a documentary on him. You should look up Ed with Dwight. He the one that did those for me. They're doing a documentary on him now. TV special, a movie sub, they're making a movie out of him. His name is Ed Dwight. Uh, let me show, on page, uh, okay, I'm listening. On page, what's that page, 98? Yes, I know, okay. Uh, what you see there, um, you see Mrs. Parks, Mrs. King, Doris Crenshaw, and uh, Fred Gray. Fred Gray was, was a lawyer for Mrs. Parks. The, and me speaking because they asked, they honored me, they brought me home. And that's the bus that Mrs. Parks refused to sit on the seat, that's the bus. And they brought me home to honor me. I was still on them because they were so proud of the Alabama girl who was still holding steady and fighting on behalf in the nonviolent righteous movement. And they brought me home. It was such a press, everyone was there. But that's the day that Wallace asked them to bring me down to the back here. But that's what that is. That's Mrs. Parks. You're gonna see a lot. Uh, I worked very closely with Winnie Mandela to get um that get that get um get ben, get Mandela out out of um, you know I helped raise money and stuff. Worked with a lot, of, but it, it looked like Hank here, but it's really a historical book. A couple of pictures in there, and, and that's my travel and stuff. But um, the other book is going to be something. But uh, that's my trail. I love Mandela. They told me Mandela had that picture um, in his office. He said, girl, yeah, he had that picture in his office when he was in the office. Um, Did you have a last question? Yeah. Can Go you ahead. tell us a little bit more about uh, your relationship with Martin Luther King Jr. and just about him in general? Oh, well, that's what I'm He was like a father to me. I guess I met him when I was nine. And, uh, we, in the, in the South, you know, everybody, when that colored man first came down, they said, got a real smart colored boy that came to Montgomery, taking over Dexter Avenue. Dexter Avenue had uh, Vernon John. Right now, Vernon John name. Vernon John was that Dexter Avenue before Dr. King. But that bougie church didn't want that man. He come up selling watermelons and greens and stuff. So they got rid of him, they brought Dr. King. But I kind of knew when the colored man came to town, smart, and we enjoyed it. You know, a little small town, but kind of knew him. I grew up around him. But as I traveled with him, he told Governor to tell my grandmother they would take care of him. He was like my father. I'm writing my book, my other my book. And, and uh, Ambassador Andrew Young just sent me a most beautiful preference for my book. So I was kind of, until I became of age, kind of under Ambassador Young and Dr. King. Uh, uh, I talk to Dr. King like I'm talking to someone's life. He was a great man. He was really great. And he really believed in what he believed in. And that's why I have to stay true to the principle of nonviolence. True to the principle that he told me. Because if he gave his life, what right do I have to play for? I get into it from that because I said, that's not right. And they didn't allow you to so I have I have a responsibility and obligation to carry on that gun. That, Dr. King's spirit. You know, we studied guns and all that. Dr. King gave his life. But the thing of it, he gave his life for us. But he, but those who reap the educational, the political, and for my community, the education, political, and economic benefit of the struggle did not come at the rebuild community. They abandoned our community. And they treat our community like social workers. To the worst than white folk, and they won't talk stuff. And they on TV leading our kids wrong. They living with white folk, living around white folk, got white friends, and telling our kids, don't trust white folk, they're systemic racist. That don't make no sense to me. You know, you hear Joe Reed talking that mess, who what? You know, Don Lennon and stuff, that stuff. His boyfriend was white, his dog was white, his cop was white, everything's white. He's telling folks they ain't white folk. And young folks watching that mess. So, you know, it, it, it's like those who reap what Dr. King said, uh, I might not be there with you, but I'm coming. But we as a people can get there. And what it meant was, in Dr. King's mind, because he was naive too for a little while, as I've gotten older, I understand that, because he had someone, but he also had faith. 
He could not in his wildest imagination to see us open up these doors and our people don't reveal to me. They ran. They can live in what they want to, but I mean, they have a, had a responsibility to rebuild the community. And that's what he never thought that they would not do. And I talked to them too. I, I said some other stuff to them, y'all. I, I can play with them when I talk to them, but they're just responsible. Those who reach benefits just are responsible for, for what's going on in our community, that's the race and anything else. Because I don't care whether you stay there, but you come help with the schools, you come do this, but you come and you treat it like, like the community's foreign when just yesterday you couldn't go downtown. It wasn't long ago that you couldn't drive the highways and byways of this country and you couldn't stay nowhere. You couldn't go in Chicago, you couldn't go west of Racine. It wasn't, that wasn't long ago. So don't try to pretend like, you know, you couldn't go west of Racine. That, that's where we fought open houses. Or you could go on highways and byways pee in the weed. <laughs> y'all remember that? Okay. Y'all right with that answer? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Yasha. 